Okay, you're looking at uh, James Robert Lefevre. I was born January 25th, 1935, in a little house on Watson Avenue. I only was there for a year, so I don't know anything about it. Uh, somewhere around the dawn of the 20th century, my great-grandfather, Henri Lefevre, took his family, a wife and four children, from Belgium, which had a rich heritage of glassblowing industry and, and guilds. And they went to South America to start a glass plant in Argentina with a group from Belgium. After that was done, they came to Toledo, Ohio, to help with the glass industry that was being set up by uh, Mike Owens here in Toledo. Eventually, my grandfather and his wife and one daughter returned to Belgium, but the three other children stayed here. My grandfather, Gaston Lefevre, uh, his brother, Edward, and a sister, I can't I might be Gertrude, I can't remember her name for sure, but uh, Gertrude may have been the oldest of the family. She uh, joined the uh, Sisters of the Poor, the white, uh, or the gray nuns here in Toledo, and she eventually wound up as the uh, mother superior of the order in uh, Montreal, so she got around quite a bit. Uh, Gaston married my grandmother, Magdalena Harder, uh, and they had their three children. Uh, he died on December 6, 1928, at an early age, and my grandmother, uh, later remarried to a man who came from Fort Wayne, Indiana, and he left the family there. He had also been married. I don't know the circumstances. It was never talked about. But uh, Howard Frank Hart married my grandmother, who was originally Magdalena Harder, and so she went from Magdalena Harder to Lena Hart. <laughs> and he was known as Frank. So my grandparents were known to us as Frank and Lena Hart. Uh, they were very outgoing people, that easy to talk to and fun to be with. And uh, we spent a lot of time uh, in our family, went over there quite often on Sundays. And uh, when we would drive over to Grandma and Grandpa's house, my dad would always take us through the center of town because we loved to see the colorful fountain that was in the city civic center there. That's long gone now, but there was a beautiful fountain in downtown Toledo at one time. And uh, my grandmother was like a second mother to me. We spent a lot of time as the family uh, at their house, having fun playing cards with my uh, aunt and uncle who lived nearby and their families. And uh, I remember one time, well, I used to take the bus at a very young age to go visit my grandmother and occasionally stay overnight. And I remember being there, remember being there one time when she was doing laundry and I saw her pour this blue stuff in the laundry. And, what, what's that, Grandma? That's bluing, she said. If she doesn't do that, Grandpa's white shirts that he wore to work would gradually turn yellow, so that made his shirt stay white. And uh, when she left the room, I got the bright idea, if it made it white, a little more bluing would make them whiter. Well, it turns out my grandfather wore blue shirts to work for a while. He was way ahead of the fashion for blue dress shirts at this time. He, uh, he was a bridge tender for the railroad, at the bridge across the Maumee River. He wore a shirt and tie to work. And uh, he was, 
a jolly old man. <laughs> he was very close. We were very close. And sometime after the World War, he, or they, I guess, purchased a cottage at uh, Carpenter Lake, west of uh, Hillsdale, Michigan. Carpenter was in the middle of uh, three lakes, uh, Hemlock to the north and Long Lake to the south. They were all connected. And uh, we spent a lot of time up at the lake, uh, on the water. Spent a lot of time with my cousin Bob up there, fishing and exploring the lakes and swimming and having a good time. Uh, my grandfather taught me how to clean fish. If I caught the fish, I had to clean them. And you're all familiar, I'm sure, with scraping the scales off the fish, but you, did you know that you had to skin bullheads? And we, it was something we quite caught, off, caught quite often. And uh, when you're skinning bullheads, you have to be pretty careful of the spikes that they have there. And you, you skin them with a pair of pliers. He, that was one thing he, one of the things he taught me up there. And uh, I remember being up there with my family once. Uh, when I was in the seventh or eighth grade, I got a, my first pair of glasses. And then we were up at the lake and uh, in the boat with my father. And he thought it would be funny to give me a shove and push me into the water. But he didn't think it was so funny when I came up without those new glasses. And uh, we spent a lot of time, a lot of good time, a lot of the, some of the best times of my teenage years were spent at that lake. Uh, I really enjoyed that, and I miss those times. Uh, he was very easy to talk to, and he was very close to me. All four of my grandparents that I knew were German descent. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather Jacobs came from uh, the Lucky area, which uh, a great number of my dis uh, ancestors migrated to the United States in the middle of the 19th century. There was a lot of migration from Germany at that time, and they all settled in the Lucky area. They moved to Toledo in you know, 1942, I guess. They were, it was Lena Jacobs, or Lena Schudel, pardon me, married Frank Jacobs. So both sets of grandparents were Frank and Lena. And none of us ever thought that was unusual. It just, that's just who they were, Frank and Lena, both sides. And they were more uh, reserved and they stayed couple, not as outgoing and friendly as my uh, other grandparents, but they were just as, as loving and uh, we uh, didn't spend quite as much time there, but we did go there. Uh, my mother was the youngest of three children. The oldest was Wayne who had a wife named June and two boys, Jan and John. Uh, he worked at a, he lived almost across the street from my grandmother on East Broadway and worked at a bank nearby. And he was a lot like my grandfather. He was, uh, yeah, he was a little stuffy. <laughs> Evelyn, my Aunt Evelyn was the middle child and she married a stonemason Don Duquette, and they had two children, Gail and Donna, a boy and a girl. Uh, and Donna was only one Anne in Donna, in her name, Donna, Donna Lee. And uh, they lived in more places than I could imagine. They met, I don't know how many states they lived in it during the time, but he was itinerant stonemason. He got around quite a bit. And uh, we would go to visit them on weekends too. And I remember it was always an occasion to go visit the grandparents because we went to grand 
Grandma and Grandpa Hart's, we'd go past the fountain downtown, and if we go to Grandma Jacob's, we'd have to cross the river, so we went across the high-level bridge to, to get to their house. And uh, Uncle Don was a character. He, uh, when they were, we were all there, he, he would often go for a walk, and when he came back, he had beer on his breath. And my grandmother was a, was a little critical of that at times, talking about uh, her her son-in-law Don. He was a drinker. And uh, my grand my grandfather Jacobs died. Uh, he was quite old, quite a bit older than my grandmother, I think, and he died fairly young also. So she was a widow for a long time. She lived to be 96. And uh, there were times when she would cross the street to the tavern that was just across the street from her and have herself a glass of beer now and then. So uh, Uncle Don wasn't so bad after all. <laughs> And she enjoyed a, a, a sip of kummel, too. I don't know if you've ever heard of kummel. That's a car caraway seed liqueur that's uh, very popular in Germany. And uh, she enjoyed the taste of that now and then. She loosened up a lot after my grandfather died, but she was a worker. Uh, as a widow, she had a numerous job. She worked as a poll worker at every election in that neighborhood. And she also worked as a companion for the old lady down the street to help, help out the old lady down the street. Well, the old lady down the street was 10 years younger than she was. But, uh, and she loved to spend time with me and my kids and her later years, and I thought it was kind of ironic that I spent so much time with my Grandma Hart when I was young, and so much time with my Grandma Jacobs when I was older, <laughs> and uh, learned to appreciate both of them at different times. Lawrence Henry Lefevre and Leola Marie Jacobs. By the age of 21, he was managing a Kroger store. He was the youngest uh, manager of a Kroger store, at least in this area that I know of. And he managed a few Kroger stores. And he uh, met my mother in the office. At, I'm not sure whether it was in the Kroger company office or a uh, supplier to the Kroger company, an office that she worked in. And that's, that's where they met through his occupation. Oh, they were wonderful. <laughs> my uh, mother was a very optimistic and cheerful woman. And uh, I remember one time she, uh, I was sitting in a chair and she told me, Jim, you can be whatever you want to be with your life. It's, <laughs> it's up to you. And uh, when I was five years old, I was interested in reading. I wanted to read. And she would be in the kitchen doing whatever mothers do in the kitchen. And I'd be sitting in the dining room trying to read a book. And I had learned my letters. So uh, I would spell out a word and to her, and she would shout back from the kitchen and what the word was, so I could go on with my reading. My father, uh, I remember distinctly, wanting to go to the Mud Hens baseball game. And on Sundays, I would pester him uh, ceaselessly to take me to the ball game. And we, we walked from our house to the Swain Field. It was uh, six or eight blocks. and. I remember holding his hand and trying to keep up with him because he walked a little faster than I did at that age. They were both uh, very exemplary people. I spent an awful lot of time at the playground at the school. 
we had a uh, baseball game every day, I think. And it was a, it was a strange baseball game because the uh, playground was a uh, cinder surface. You didn't want to fall down. <laughs> and uh, it was very long and narrow. So our baseball field uh, was all left field. There was no right field. The, the uh, infield took up most of the space. And uh, when we played baseball, anybody that hit the ball to right field was out. We'd play ball with uh, three, four, five guys on a side. And uh, it was all one-sided game because you only had a left field to work with. And uh, I remember one time my dad came down to the field and he, he got in the game for a few innings. He played, he played with us. And that was a, a special memory. It was not an elementary school. Nobody ever called the school elementary school back then. It was a grade school. <laughs> now that now it's they're all elementary schools. And uh, I remember uh, in the first grade, 1941. Uh, was uh, Pearl Harbor Day while I was in school. And I remember in the second grade then when we had some kind of paper to write uh, and we always put our name and the date at the top of the paper we were writing. So I remember writing December 7th, 1942, Pearl Harbor Day. <laughs> and... Uh, I uh, especially remember my first grade teacher, Mrs. Clark, and my eighth grade teacher, Mrs. Moomaw, that they were uh, what people would call mentors nowadays, I guess, that uh, I really admired both of them. And I liked all my teachers pretty much, but they, those two stood out for me. Most of my free time was spent at the playground with my friends and uh, we played a lot of baseball and we even played a little football when the, when the snow fell because when the playground was covered with snow and packed it down, then you didn't get hurt so much when you fell on the cinders. And there was a, a, a what we called monkey bars, a, a exercise swing set and uh, I got pretty good at those, climbing on the monkey bars, and I could hang by my toes. You know, some people hang by their knees. I could hang by my toes from the monkey bars. I didn't weigh much. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's a, gets to be a long story, I think, how I, what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, I think it was in the seventh or eighth grade that we had some kind of a, a drawing class, a drafting class, and that, that always interested me. And I took drafting classes when I was uh, in high school. I had a pretty good teacher to teaching drafting, and my thought was to become an architect. When I was in high school, I uh, applied for uh, admission to MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and uh, I was accepted, which was very nice. And when I told my parents, I found out that we can't afford that. <laughs> so I wound up uh, switching from architecture to uh, structural engineering, and I went to the University of Toledo. To, and it turns out that that was probably a good thing for, to happen to me, that uh, switching from architecture to engineering, because I really enjoyed that. I worked summers to earn money to, for tuition. Uh, and 
while after I graduated from high school, I also got a job as a dance instructor. I first learned how to dance in their, their class and then started teaching. I suddenly got hit with the, the love bug and got married and started raising four children. So in the middle of my junior year, I dropped out of high school. The teacher, the drafting teacher at Scott High School uh, referred me to a builder to draw some house plans. And I just did quite a bit of work with him for a while. In fact, the, uh, the house we're in right now, the original house was one that I drew the plans for. He had uh, either four, four or five lots on this street right in a row, and I drew the plans for all, all of them. And uh, I remember drawing plans for uh, an apartment building for him and, and different places, and that got me started in, in my career. I got the jobs as a draftsman in various places, uh, starting with Gulf Oil Company. At the time, they were a big outfit, and we were designing gas stations in Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Kentucky, all over the place. Hundreds of gas stations went through our office. And I worked there for a couple years, maybe two and a half, and uh, had an opportunity to uh, increase my uh, earnings by going to uh, LOF. And I did some work for the Libby Owens Ford Technical Center, uh, again, drafting, drawing plans for different buildings and things. And, uh, and that was over in East Toledo. That kind of industry has uh, pretty volatile and I got laid off there. Finally got a job with R.C. Reese Associates, a structural engineer, and it was an opportunity for to put my limited, uh, abbreviated education to work. I went to work there in 1961, and in a few years after that, without benefit of a college degree, I managed to pass the... Uh, engineer's bar exam, I guess you'd call it. I uh, was qualified then as a professional engineer. And in 1980, or shortly before 1980, uh, Gary Tanike moved to Dallas, and I was invited to become a partner in 1980 and uh, worked another almost 30 years as a partner. As I said, I Spent three years in college uh, when I should have, when I was young, and then gave it up. But I would manage to become a structural engineer, professional engineer, through uh, self self education, self training. But I went back to the university uh, like 25 years later. Uh, I first entered the university in 1953 and uh, graduated in 1986, finally. <laughs> I'm really proud of what I did. I can go practically anywhere in Toledo and find a building that I worked on. And at one time, most of the buildings at the University of Toledo came out of our office. Uh, before I was there, uh, the original University of Toledo buildings were designed in that office. I, over the years, I designed quite a few buildings at the university, uh, including the uh, uh, Student Activity Center, which is quite a large building, uh, the Law Library, uh, which is out on Secor Road, and I felt very proud about uh, being the designer of uh, what at the time was Centennial Hall and is now Savage Hall in, in uh, UT. 
Uh, that was a particularly challenging design uh, that there's 20 foot high earth on one side and the other side is right down to the ground floor. So uh, there's a lot of earth pressure trying to push that building into the river and I didn't want to let it do that. I remember when they were working uh, that area, when they crossed the river uh, to build that building, they also built the parking lot out there. And I can remember what terrible soil it was because it was uh, river bottom land and all the buildings were on deep caissons, which are concrete piers drilled into the ground. And the earth was uh, quite wet. And I remember seeing trucks driving across the ground and the, the, the ground just had a, a wake, like a ship going through the water. It left a wake behind the trucks that they were the ground. <laughs> so it was a difficult job all the way around. If you go to Cedar Point, you see a lot of buildings that I designed. <laughs> Not only uh, structurally, but architecturally also. The, everything on the, uh, the trail, the uh, Frontier Trail, the bar and grill there that starts the trail, and all the way back to the uh, far, far end of the park. In, in the 1990s, we were the engineer for Cedar Point. We, we did all their uh, ride foundations. They, the, when they bought a ride, they bought it as a package, but they had to have the foundation designed for their rides, and that's what we did. And we you know, did their buildings, too. And uh, that was the central of my three-pronged career. In uh, John's junior year at Whitmer, that's my son John, as you all know, he took up soccer, and I would go to his games. We went to all the boys' baseball games when they were younger, but he switched to soccer his freshman year in high school, and I didn't understand the game. I didn't know the rules, and we'd go to his games. And at one of his games, my cousin, Steve Lefevre, from the, uh, my Uncle Bob's boy, fourth youngest boy, was the referee at the game. And I said, Steve, I don't understand this game. How can I learn the rules? Can you, can you help me with that? And he says, I got just a thing for you. He says, there's a class starting at the university for uh, soccer referees. And he says, you'll learn the rules. So I did, I took this class and uh, when it was over, the uh, Eddie Clements, who was the teacher and a very uh, good soccer referee from England, said, uh, okay, we'll sign you up when you wanna have your first game. <laughs> and uh, so in the spring of 1976, I started refereeing soccer and that turned into a 29-year side career, refereeing high school soccer, men's club soccer, and for a number of years, uh, the uh, college soccer. And I was a member of the Ohio Collegiate Soccer Officials Association and the Northwest Ohio Soccer Officials Association, which was related to the uh, high school. And I spent two years as president of the NWOSOA. Uh, and that was my second side career. I remember growing up, uh, we were just coming out of the depression when I was born. And we, uh, my dad worked through the Depression, so he was not one of the uh, millions of unemployed, thankfully. So we had adequate food and shelter, and, and uh, we had enough clothes to 
keep us. And we weren't poor by any means. And we had a good life. But on the other hand, we weren't exactly affluent. <laughs> and uh, I was the first in my family to attend college. And it was a struggle. As I mentioned before, I had to quit in my junior year, and it was 30-some years later when I went back, or 25 years later when I went back to school and graduated some years later. So I might hold the record for uh, longevity, 33 years to get a master or a bachelor's degree. Uh, there are things that I may have wanted to do uh, not all that important. Uh, there, are, I would have liked to travel more I, out of the country. I would have enjoyed going to Europe or Asia, or, but that never seemed to be uh, never seemed to be a good time to do any of that. And I never got around to it. I'm quite proud that all four of my children are college graduates and. Almost every one of my grandchildren are college graduates. So I'm pretty proud of that. Most thankful that I was able to uh, arise from humble beginnings, if that's not a cliche, and uh, do what I did and to raise a wonderful family. And I, I see people who uh, can't stand their siblings and they don't get along, and um, I, th <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this, but I think of Donald Trump and his niece at the moment, and I am so happy that my family, my siblings and I are all congenial, and uh, all my children and grandchildren seem to get along well, enjoy each other's company, and I'm very pleased with that. When, when you're young, when I was young, uh, I f can't say I felt immortal, but uh, I think young people have a sense of immortality and they take risks. And that's probably a good thing when you're young, that you can take risks in life and occupation and, and see what your limits are and go about and live your life and enjoy it. But as you grow older, you uh, you don't concentrate on it, but you become aware of the inevitability of death. Uh, you know it's not something that's going to happen. And the older you get, the less you fear death. Talking about my kids and how proud I am of them, I have to give some credit where credit is due. Uh, I married in 1956, and I said I was going to the university, and I went to the university for three years uh, during the time that I was first married. And in those three years, we had three children, and uh, fourth one, a few years later, and after about 10 years, the marriage fell apart. And the kids had a really rough time for a few years that, uh, with the family split up like that. And uh, after about five years, I or four years, I met a lovely young woman named Roberta Gray and uh, married her, and I would like to uh, say that she is one of the positive influences on these children that I'm so proud of. She's been a, a great help to me and to the kids, and I appreciate it, and I appreciate her. It's a great source of pride to know that uh, that uh, 
education was so, so important to the family. I hope that the grandchildren will carry on in that tradition. I know it means a lot to me and to their parents, I'm sure. I only hope that they stay true to themselves and uh, show a lot of integrity. And, uh, I can't think of the words anymore, but all I can say is I'm very proud of the family. What kind of conclusion can I have? I, I've lived 85 years. I've enjoyed most of it. Some of it was, quite a bit of it was a struggle, but uh, I got through it. And uh, this coronavirus pandemic that we're living in right now is uh, not the kind of conclusion that I anticipated for my life. So I hope this goes away and that uh, everyone can return to what they consider to be a more normal life. <laughs>